anger is the scapegoat of emotions. It's universally almost uh, condemned as inappropriate. And as such, it's universally misunderstood because it can be a great source of fuel for doing good. Do you like books? I'm outlining a new writing project. Who wrote this book? Read it. Read it. Sometimes I write something. What are you writing? Have you written anything lately? I'm Amanda Stern, and this is Bookable. On today's show, enough is enough. Are you as exhausted as I am? Does this pandemic and political hellscape feel like a job you're not allowed to quit and you just want to take this life and shove it? But what if you could channel all of your rage into something positive and worthwhile? I don't need headsets, do I? Well, our guest today... You want me to do a test? That's precisely his prescription. Let me do it again. Time for a proper introduction. Hi, I'm Dr. Stephen Burglass, author of Stay Hungry and Kick Burnout in the Butt. Dr. Stephen Burglass. The book explores what makes us feel fulfilled and self-actualized and what burns us out. Turns out most of us don't really know what that means. The term burnout has been abused, bended, folded, spindled, mutilated. It, it, the term doesn't exist in a, in a way that has real meaning. Okay, well, I can't think of a better time to truly understand my own mental state. So, Dr. Steve, lay it on me. Well, burnout is when you feel that your mind is wasted, when your skills are wasted, when yourself as an entity that is capable of creative production is wasted. And this can happen irrespective, I need to emphasize, of salary, compensation, etc. You don't make a person feel good if they're earning X by giving them 2X. Consider your favorite food. You have it breakfast, lunch, and dinner. People say, oh, I'm never going to go tired of Ben and Jerry's. And you have it every day, every day, every day. Well, I promise you, at the end of the month, you won't look at ice cream. You will find ice cream as loathsome as medicine. But if you switch, you can find a variety of taste sensations that are rewarding and and keep you hungry. A lot of people don't understand they're burning out because it's, it's difficult to say, hey, look, I'm being compensated more than I ever dreamed I'd be compensated. Yet, they still feel this antagonistic, uh, negative, I don't want to go to work, I don't want to be there. It's, I want to be elsewhere, is one of the key elements of burnout. Get me out of here. From Stay Hungry, Chapter 1. The problem with rewards is that they should come with an expiration date, but seldom do. Every reward, even the most intense, is initially uplifting, but will, in short order, not work as intended or expected. Nothing is equipped, really, to provide ongoing psychological rewards unless something has grabbed you by the soul and drives you to keep improving. Continuous improvement of something you're passionate about is the only way to stay involved psychologically in a task. It doesn't matter what the task is. But if I hypothetically set a goal for myself, which most jobs have inherently built into them, reach this end point. Well, at the end point, when you've met the criteria for the job, you say, what's next? And if that's not there, the rewards cease. If you say, I want to make the world a better place in X, Y, Z way, or I want to improve life in X, Y, Z way, or if you're passionate about making a wrong no longer exist, well, that's a pretty ongoing phenomenon. And what happens when you get the right passion in life is there are no prescribed endpoints. There's no, I did it. There's no hurrah. Now, if you're developing a polio vaccine, hypothetically, and that's your passion, granted, you may eliminate the disease, but 
Trust me, every person who does something like that would find another disease to fight. But at a job, even if the job in your mind is to become CEO of XYZ Corporation, well, when you get there, then what? There's always a then what with career tracks or the career ladder. And that top of the ladder, end of the track, is a psychological disappointment. What does it mean to stay hungry? Why would you feel that this is a positive as opposed to a negative? Okay, the phrase has been used by a lot of people, but I took it from Ecclesiastes, which states that everyone's toil is for their mouth, yet their appetite is never satisfied. Stay hungry means find something, some pursuit in life that will give you the ongoing rewards of a restaurant that never has the same dish on the menu twice, the spouse that doesn't give you repetitive praise that becomes like a mantra, the job that gives you daily different types of feedback that you're doing a good job. When you aim at success, when you have a target, you hit that end point that I referred to earlier, and you are really not engaged in the process of the activity. Staying hungry means focusing on the process, which is an ongoing appetitive drive. I want to be enriched. I want to be given a full panoply of stimuli that are gratifying. And not gratifying in terms of amassing wealth. One of the greatest myths uh, perpetrated on people is that he who dies with the most toys wins. That's baloney. Um, He who dies with the most toys is always looking to acquire a new one. Because you look out the window, someone else has a bigger toy. You drive a Corvette, someone drives a Bentley. It's always that way. And if you're marking success by acquisition, it goes through you like an empty Ming vase. It's beautiful, but the rewards don't stay there. They go through you. What you need is something that makes you carry a feeling of this is good. This is great. I'm doing the Lord's work. And when you feel that way, first of all, it's never done. Second of all, there's always applications for what you've accomplished. And thirdly, there are new challenges. From Stay Hungry, Chapter 2. If you're feeling put upon at work or that you may crack under the pressure of performance demands, you may say, getting my report rejected was the straw that broke the camel's back. This view, i.e. cracking under the weight of accumulated burdens, is the most common way the term stress is used today. And what this notion led to is the widely held belief that psychological stress is a force lurking outside us. But that simply isn't true. Stress does not lurk outside. Stress and burnout aren't even close cousins. They're different phenomenon. Um, I talk about the yin and yang of stress and point out that there's a positive form of stress, which is called eustress. And what most people think of as stress, in quotes, is distress. And let me give you the example I've used since I was a boy. Many people go skiing. They will stand on top of a mountain and their hearts will start pounding, and they'll feel an adrenaline rush. And as they go down the hill, potentially fearful of, what if I hit a mogul? What if I don't do this right? That's called eustress. And when you get to the bottom of that hill, you are exhilarated. I mean, it's, I did it. And then that was the bunny hill. Well, as you go from bunny hill to intermediate to advanced to black diamond, you feel increased levels of eustress because the challenges rise and once you master them, you're exhilarated. Then there's me who looks at skiing as a masochistic endeavor. If you ask me to go skiing with you, the expert skier, to me it would be distress. It would be a threat. And that's what's distress more accurately is. It's a threat. So if I see a lion, 
Is that going to cause stress? Well, not if it's in a cage or not if it's in a film, but if it's on Fifth Avenue in Manhattan, it's going to cause stress. There's no such thing as a f- stimuli that causes stress. Stress is a totally eye of the beholder phenomenon. Public speaking, more people have less of a fear of dying than they do of public speaking. And I get you stress from speaking, but I will promise you, most people get distress. I was in an event last night, an awards dinner last night, and someone had to give a toast, and he was standing at the bar, you know, getting liquid courage. And he says, you want to give the toast to me? I said, in a heartbeat. You know, it doesn't stress me, but that mountain, even the Buddy Hill, is a major stressor to me. Time for a short break. When we come back, we let our anger out. My favorite. And it's a good thing. Stick around. Welcome back to Bookable. I'm Amanda Stern here with Dr. Stephen Berglass, author of Stay Hungry and Kick Burnout in the Butt. According to Dr. Steve, anger is healthy. Anger is the whipping boy of emotions. And as such, it's universally misunderstood because it can be a great source of fuel for doing good. Let me take mothers against drunk driving. Well, The woman who lost her daughter, Leitner was her name, was told essentially that the guy who killed her daughter while drunk would get minimal jail time, definitely nothing of a compensatory nature. What Leitner did to her lifelong credit is she said, okay, I'm going to stop drunk drivers, not punish the man who killed my daughter. I don't want society suffering as it does from all the individuals killing other mothers' children. So she created Mothers Against Drunk Drivers that did more than set up breathalyzers and checks. It created new legislation. It created, you know, stiffer punishments. It created all sorts of positive things. And most importantly, it created a universal awareness of this horrific blight on society. So she didn't target someone and seek revenge. She sought an entrepreneurial way to make society better. Another example is John Walsh. He was an incredibly successful uh, real estate developer. He lost his son, Adam, and he created myriad entrepreneurial endeavors, the most famous being the television show America's Most Wanted, where instead of going after the perpetrator of the crime that took his son from him, he went after every criminal. He said none of them should be allowed to harm others in society. And he also created a series of public awareness campaigns and ways in which the public could come to inform police about the existence of criminals in their neighborhoods. And that gave birth to things like community watch or the phenomenon we see every day, which is if you're suspicious of someone and you think there's potential terrorist activity, call the police. He changed the ethos of America from one that tattling would be universally frowned upon to where tattling with a preventative goal in mind is applauded. And that's how you feel good about yourself for life. Does he ever get over the pain of losing his son? No, but nor would he feel better if he set up a firing squad and pulled the trigger on the person who killed his son. Vengeance doesn't work. It's an empty feeling. From Stay Hungry, Chapter 1. Ultimately, everything we do must afford us some modicum of reward, uplift, or pleasure. Sigmund Freud was the first to codify this notion in his Pleasure Principle. 
Humans are instinctively hardwired to seek pleasure and avoid pain. So if you don't get something by way of psychological rewards for doing something, you'll stop doing the thing. You have to feel a sense of generativity. You're leaving the world a better place. That begins with empathy. It's understanding that you are part of humanity. And if you decide that you're going to leave the world a better place, not richer yourself, but the world a better place, and you do something about it, all of these endeavors are what make you able to stay hungry in a very, very gratified way. My favorite example from the book is the lawyer Barry Sheck. Barry Sheck is a man who, as a boy, lost his sister to a house fire. Now, Sheck has carried with him a passion to address unjust phenomenon, from the war in Vietnam when he was at Yale to now when he works for a project he created called the Innocence Project. Sheck is a highly compensated, incredibly well-respected lawyer half the time, and then he puts on his Innocence Project suit and he works to reverse injustices that have been imposed on people who have been inappropriately jailed. Now, Sheck has never been inappropriately jailed, to my knowledge, but the injustice of losing a sister he loved, injustices that he saw in college, have driven this man to fight injustices in a societally beneficial way his entire life. And the undoing of a wrong is the key inoculation against burnout. Because you can work in anything and have time and, more importantly, energy to say, this is wrong, and I'm going to fix it, and bring your skill sets to bear on the problem. The other thing about looking at these entrepreneurial endeavors that inoculate you against burnout as group activities is you become reinforced by myriad sources. So they're not just, here's your check, go home. Here's your check, go home. You're saving people from pain and you're improving humanity. Dr. Steven Berglass, author of Stay Hungry and Kick Burnout in the Butt. It's published by Hachette Group and is available now. Bookable is a production of Loud Tree Media. I'm your host, Amanda Stern, five feet tall and inching my way toward positivity. We're produced by me, Bo Friedlander, and Andrew Dunn, who also mixed and sound designed the show. Bo is Loud Tree's editor in chief. Find us on the web at bookablepod.com and please subscribe and rate us five stars on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your shows. And there's a ton of great stuff on our Instagram. That's at bookablepod. And you can also follow me at a little stern. Okay, Dr. Steve, there's one last thing I've been meaning to ask you. Oh, so you're wondering, have I ever been burnt out? No, that's incredibly personal. I'd never ask you that. But yeah, that's totally my question. No, I, I like to be caught, you know, I'll tell you a story later about that. This is Bookable.